I am walking on Hadrian's Wall. Um, funny enough, the entire wall is actually a, a governmentally registered footpath, and so you can walk clear from one end of the country to the other along Hadrian's Wall. And they prepared the top surface, so this is actually okay. One thing you wonder about this wall is how necessary it was from a practical point of view. Um, how good is it at keeping people out? Is that what it's for? Is there an invasion coming from that way? Is everyone watching this way, waiting for the hordes to come over, the, come over and try to attack the wall at any point along its 83 mile length? Probably not. In many ways, this was a trade barrier, similar to um, a customs border where you walk through and declare your goods and you know fill out that little paperwork when you get off the airplane. When we got into the Barcelona airport, there were guards running around with like M16 rifles um, just to make sure that nothing bad happened. And you wonder, you know, how often have they ever fired a bullet out of those? Well, probably sometimes at the training range, but actually at the airport, that would make the news. In many ways, this border serves the same function. Every mile, there's a castle called a mile castle, which is a gate, a guarded gate, guarded by 16 men. And these mile castles are, are trading ports. You can get things in and out only with permission, only after paying your taxes. There's actually a lot of archaeological evidence that suggests that the Roman influence spread quite a bit past this wall. There was a lot of trade going back and forth. This isn't, you know, a hard boundary that Rome is on this side and you know, Scots are on that side and we just don't deal with each other and if they try to climb over we, we stab them. No, it's, it's more mundane than that. For me though, that mundane quality is itself interesting. It helps me to contextualize it within my own experience to say, this world is not so different from the one in which I inhabit. I could see something that fills the same function at the airport, and I will on the way home. One of the benefits of travel is seeing what is different and what is the same. And you're going to find surprises in both. You'll say, oh, I didn't realize that that could be done differently, that the, that the food is so incredibly different, or the uh, driving on the street is so different, or whatever. But on the other hand, seeing what is the same. In a way, getting that broader context of, of traveling, even in your own time, is is very helpful for understanding what is fundamentally human and what is not, what is layered on and what is not. In a similar way, visiting a historical place like this is like traveling to the past. Here I found something that is very different. We don't use stone walls in airports, but the idea of going through customs and anything to declare, that's very much the same. That's one reason for exploring, both laterally in your own time and also vertically through history. To, to see what is different and what is the same, because doing that helps you to see what is fundamental, what is core. Uh, it's very easy to assume that some things that are culturally yours are fundamentally human and that anyone who does it differently is a savage or not, not quite human. But it's also very easy to see that much of what you see in other people is fundamental. It's the fund same fundamental problems, the same fundamental essence of human nature that is everywhere. That exploration in that context does two things. One, it, it helps you to just be grounded in terms of what's normal and what's not. And in the second case, seeing other solutions to the same problems allows you to make qualitative judgments. Some solutions are better than others. And that exploration helps you to know what's available. As always, if you enjoyed the video and found it interesting, then please hit the like button below. And if you're new to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. We look forward to seeing you next time. So I just ate a piece of stinging nettle, which is edible. And if you pull it a certain way, it breaks all the little needles. I did that and mashed it a little bit and then I ate it. Apparently I didn't get all the needles because there's a little patch of my tongue that's numb. Tastes good though. 
It's a little bit like an alfalfa drink, but a little more satisfying. <laughs> you know, there's a point about this that's worth making. Um, I don't feel very comfortable in a landscape unless I can identify at least two common plants that are edible. For me, those here are nettles. Apparently, there's an art to eating nettles. An art which I have not mastered. And the other is the common dandelion. In the United States, dandelions are actually an introduced species. They're not native. They were brought over on the Mayflower two stories for the reason why. The first is that it was as a, a salad green, something to get some flavor, it has a bite. Or potentially as fodder for bees. Um, bees are also an introduced species. They aren't native to the United States or Americas in general. And they require, you know, something to eat early in the year when there weren't any native plants that would fill that bill. And so dandelions, by blooming much earlier, were able to provide sustenance fodder for the bees. They're pretty good though. <laughs>